So this uh, tonight, um, I'm giving the the opportunity to be able to speak to you, and um, uh, and I'm grateful for it. And um, tonight, I, I had stud, been studying for a couple weeks on what to speak on, um, and uh, what to either preach or teach on. And I feel like the Lord has gave me something today. And uh, it is, what time is it? What time is it? Before I get into the message, I, I just would like to, to, to paint a picture for you uh, of the before and up to the birth of Jesus. And let you know exactly what had been going on and what was going on at that time. Hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, um, the Greeks had come in and introduced and forced on all the, the people, their culture, and this culture was called Hellenism. Uh, Hellenism, which was a lot of things, but the main focus I want to stress here was that Hellenism was a pursuit of knowledge, to know, to be able to read and to write. And it wasn't just for the, the, the upper class. The, the Greeks felt that it, you, everybody should be able to read and to write and to, to enjoy the arts, um, to be able to enjoy those things. And um, they also, they, the pursuit of a single world, one world order. Uh, they believed that all people, not just the upper class, should be able to, to enjoy these things. And with that world, one world, they had a, a one world type of government with, one, with a one world type of currency. And with a one type, one one, you know, one type of world, uh, of course, taxes. Uh, we can't get away from taxes. They, the taxes have always been around, but they wanted to come into this one world thing. But after the death of Alexander the Great, does everybody know who Alexander the Great was? Well, he was the he was Alexander the Great. He was this great guy from from Greece. But he was one of the greatest generals of all time. That really, as far as I've ever known, never lost a battle that he lost his life to malaria. And uh, in around uh, the providence of India, that with that, uh, the, the Greek empire began to, to crumble from there. Uh, but see, you understand that the area, which is now we call the Middle East, was just a, at that time whenever the, the Greek empire began to fail and Alexander the Great had, had died, that, that this was the big bunch of... of, of Struggling countries and empires there that were just struggling and they would fight over anything and everything. They'd be fighting over small pieces of land that they might have in this country that the other country wanted or over religions. Doesn't sound no different than it is today, does it? But this is what was going on. That these struggling empires that they waged war against each other, and uh, we we see through the eyes of history that the Roman Empire came out, and this was birthed about 27 B.C. and they enter the scene. Here come the Romans, okay? And the Romans liked the Greek culture; they didn't want to change all that, but they wanted to come in and and to take control. And this is about 27 B.C., okay? And and at this time, you know, uh, you've got. Uh, Caesar Augustus that's in power. Herod the Great is the actual king over the area of Judea. And Herod didn't originally want this task. He just showed up to the, to the Romans in Rome and to the council and said, Look, we want to get this other guy back in power. But in the end, they voted him in as king of the Jews. And you know what happens when... To a lot of people, when they get the power, power trip went to his head. And let me tell you something, Herod was a very, very, very evil person. Very evil. We know in the stories about when, when Jesus was born that he murdered every child in the area from two years old to birth. He wanted to make sure that this king of the Jews was dead. But the time of history of our Savior's birth is between 6 and 4 B.C., 
They, they argue about the time that he was actually born. But I, I can pretty much tell you this, that it had to be between 6 and 4 B.C. because Herod the Great was alive, and that's what the Word of God says. I don't care what the other historians say. I, I base everything off the Word of God. And the Word of God says that Herod the Great was in power when Christ was born, and Herod the Great died in 4 B.C. Amen? So the Bible and world history tell us that Herod the Great was the king of the Jews. He was made king by the Romans. Augustus Caesar was the emperor, it was the emperor of the Roman Empire. Now understand, Augustus was a wise ruler. He secured the borders of the empire and they built roads. And the result was a new era of peace and stability. And this was called Pax Romana. In other words, what they did was, is here come the Romans into the Middle East and other areas, of course, but we want to focus on the Middle East. They come in and say, okay, there's not going to be no more wars between y'all. If there's going to be any wars and killings, we're going to do it. So y'all can just chill out. And for this, you're going to pay taxes to the emperor. And we're going to put our guys in charge to rule you. So if there's anything that happens, we'll know about it. And then we'll come in and destroy y'all of the, the, the zealots the terrorists that may rise up. He reorganized the provinces to achieve more than just administration, but instituted tax reform and developed a civil service and engaged in many public works and projects, especially in Rome. Wow, doesn't that sound familiar? Tax reform and, and all these projects that, that was going on, you know, inside the empire. I mean, some things just never change or some promises never change. It was during the reign that, his reign, that Jesus of Nazareth, our Savior, was born. See, where it might have looked good to the historians and even some of the cultures, even in Judea. But let it be known, the people of God were under oppressive rule of Rome. They were under oppressive Rome. They, they oppressed them, they pushed them down, and they kept them. This is evident in the birth story of Jesus in Luke chapter 2 and 1. Records that the census was taken and was ordered to be taken by actually Caesar Augustus. It was a blatant reminder that the people of Israel were owned by another and not themselves. You're going to go back to where you're originally from and you're going to be counted. All the Roman Empire was. So that in turn, here is, here is Joseph, who is literally the stepdad of Jesus. And he takes Mary back to his hometown, and, which is Bethlehem. Now some of you may know the story of Joseph, but I'm going to act like you don't. Okay? Because I've got the microphone. <laughs> Amen? Joseph was actually from the lineage of David. If you look back, Joseph's great, 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 great grandpa was David. J Joseph's great, 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 great grandma was Ruth. And his great, 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 great grandma before that was, Beth, was, was uh, um, Tamar as well as Rahab the harlot. He come through the lineage of Christ, come through Joseph. Now, even though that Joseph was not his his biological daddy, if Israel had never, ever disobeyed God. See, understand that they were all in this mess because of disobedience. Always disobedience. As, as Pastor Mike Jones talks about it, it's always God substitutes and idols. Now, someday I'll get to preach the sermon series on the, the tale of two trees, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. But it's always been about they wanted to be their own selves. They wanted their own king. They wanted to be like other nations. They wouldn't obey God. And because of that reason, they were being ruled by Rome. They even had a, a, a king who was not even really a Jew. Herod was not even, he had conformed, his family years before had conformed to Judaism. But he was from Esau's blood. He was an Edomite. Is that correct, Edomite? Okay. He was from the Esau's bloodline. So think about this. You know how mad it made those zealots, which are terrorists, to understand that their king that was over, that had built their, their new temple, added onto it, that was in their, their palace and was ruling over them, wasn't really even a Jew. 
But this was never God's way. It was their own way they had went. If you look back and rewind, Joseph would have been in the royal palace if they never would have disobeyed. See, understand that Herod was just a pawn, set in power by the Roman council about 20 years before this. And they, they put him there so to make sure that uh, everything was carried out to their likings. Long gone were there, was their days of the Davidic king. See, much like today, there were soldiers that walked around in the major cities, especially Jerusalem. But the difference was, instead of being Israeli soldiers, 19, 20, 21, 22 year old, carrying around M16s, they're actually Roman soldiers, keeping order. So here is the, the, the capital of the Jews, Jerusalem being controlled, and there is a non Jew that is now the king. Rome is actually pulling his strings like a puppet, telling him what to do. And in the end, they're waiting. For the foretold one, the Messiah to come, the anointed one, the, the, the Prince of Peace. See, they looked at him as being the one that would come and free them from Roman oppression. I want to fast forward about 33 and a half years. Remember when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and they started crying out, Hosanna, long live the king, long live the king. That was the king they were calling out. They were calling him out to be that that Messiah to free them from Roman and, and even Herod's kin's kids, their rule. But that's not what Jesus came for. It wasn't that, that wasn't the reason. They were in bondage because of disobedience and that there was no other way. There was no other way. In some ways, Israel had escaped their exile. They were back home. No longer did they live in Babylon or in other lands, but in many ways they were still exiles in their own country. Even their own temple built by a foreigner, Herod the Great, who was actually a descendant of a rival nation. And now you realize that most of the nations that were giving them problems, God told them to get rid of anyway, and they didn't. Disobedience once again. Anticipating the birth of the Christ, the birth of the Messiah, the great deliverer, the one that was foretold by the prophets since centuries before Mary even gave birth, would take his seat on David's throne and take control of their land, which they had to control of to begin with and would have had if they just had not been disobedient to their God. That this king would lead them out of yet again out of their bondage. And they would be in prosperity to become the greatest nation in the whole entire world. As I was typing this up, the revelation hit me. I'm like, how stupid were the Jews? Time and time again I see this. But then I looked in the mirror and said, how stupid am I? There's no difference. Any time that I choose to make my own decisions, I put myself as an idol. Any time that I disobey God by going 57 miles an hour in a 55, I heard you, Pastor Mike. I'm disobeying. It's the same principle. So who am I to say how dumb the Jews were because I'm pretty dumb myself? Amen, Walls. My wife's in Florida. She would say, Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just had to say that. Because I look at them and sometimes I look at what happened at the Red Sea and how he parted the Red Sea and how they come through and they seen all this happen. And I said, boy, Chip Plemons would never make that mistake. I would, I would never, ever have not believed that I could go in there and whoop them big old giants that they're in the promised land. Are you kidding me? I do it every day that I don't obey him. Every day that I have to think that I have to take control and do things my own way because I don't truly trust in God and his word because 
Let's be honest, guys. That's why we have to repent constantly because we don't always hear the voice. Or at least we hear it and we act like we don't. This time in history, the daily life in the fairly new formed uh, Greco-Roman Empire in some aspects looked good in some people's eyes. Not just the upper class were reading and writing like never before, but they were traveling and possibly enjoying some economic stability. For some and for others, they were in poverty. It was costly at times, but through world history, they say it was kind of stable. Kind of like today. We think of Christmas as a season of lights. It's lights. That's why I have lights everywhere because the reason why we do that is because Jesus was the light of the world. But I want you to understand something. We think of Christmas as a season of light, but the truth is the birth story of Jesus Christ was filled with darkness all around him. The world was dark and evil and had no hope. They had came in and, and the Greeks had set up this Hellenistic way of life that people were enjoying things and reading things, enjoying the arts. And then, and then the Romans come in and they, they make these Roman roads so people are able to, they're reading and writing and they're traveling places they've never been. Things are coming in, all kinds of diseases are coming in. So you've got all these soothsayers coming in, think they got all this healing and stuff. And all types of other religions coming in and out. And it becomes so dark and so dreary and so nasty and so rotten. But God's sovereign. Amen? Amen? He let that happen so the light would be so bright. Now some of y'all may not like Joel Osteen. But Joel Osteen said this. Flashlight was not created for outside in the light. It's not created for daytime. If you have a flashlight by your front door, you don't turn it on and try to show, show, shine it outside to see something during the day. Unless there's an eclipse. The last time I know it was just one of those in the past, as long as I can remember. And I'm 47 years old. I am 47. I know I look older. But. Light was created for darkness. And God allowed it to become so dark that when the light came, it was so shined so bright that those that were looking for light were able to see it. But see, you understand, the world has not changed. If anything, it's gotten darker and darker. So the light is so much shine, so much brighter, but the problem is, is the world is not looking for the light. Isaiah writes in the chapter, the ninth chapter, the light was coming into the world and came into a shrouded in dark, people shrouded in darkness, gloom, anguish, and content were just some of the, adject the, the adjectives to describe the time that when Christ was to come. Anguish, gloom, darkness, oppression, all this, no hope. Now understanding the darkness, darkness is what it is. You can't see the light. You don't know what's around you. You could be, there could be something lurking right there to, to kill, steal, and destroy you. And when you're in the darkness, you don't know it. That's why, they, that's why they needed the light, and that's why we need light today. So you understand, when Christ was born, the Word of God, no prophetic words, had not been spoken in centuries centuries, over, way above 400 years. God had not spoken a prophetic word. Nothing had been wrote. Nothing. Now they call that the, the, the silent years. Maybe God wasn't speaking, but I, 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 did, I did a paper in Bible college about those silent years. He may not have been speaking, but he was doing this because he's sovereign. 
everything was falling in place. See, the last thing that was spoken was in the book of Malachi. And it's the last book in the Old Testament written in the 5th century B.C. It concludes with the statement that God would send Elijah the prophet as the forerunner for the Messiah. But since that statement, which eventually would be fulfilled in John the Baptist, God had been silenced since. Now understand that everything that had to happen, everything that had to happen was perfect. The darkness that come in, the Romans that come in, the oppression, all when everything looked gloom and doom. I mean, that's, just, this is, that's what Isaiah wrote. Gloom, anguish, and contempt were just some of the adjectives used to describe the darkness that they were in. Terribly bad. But when the fullness of time had come, Time had come. Everything that had to happen for the plan to happen had already happened. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. To redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now understand, it was gloom, doom, and it was terrible. There was no hope, but that was the fullness of time. They were under oppression. They had built roads. People were reading. Now understand that me, if I wanted to get on a, a camel or a horse, or whatever they travel on over yonder, and I wanted to go all the way to Greece or I wanted to go up to, to, to Rome and do whatever, I was free to do that. They wouldn't oppress me from doing that. So what that meant, if I wanted to go at the time, like John the Baptist, if he hadn't been, if he'd been led by the Holy Spirit to go up to those places, he could have went. Now people were being able to write and to read, so actually all the words that Jesus spoke, they were able to pin them down. And then they were able to read. See, before the Greeks come in, normal people could not read and write. Only the upper class. You know what that means? I wouldn't have been able to read or write. Just the upper class. But in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, to redeem me so I may be adopted. Time to be a light. I ask you what time it was. The first thing is time to be a light. In Matthew chapter 5, 14 through 16, Jesus compares his followers to light, saying, We are the light of the world, unable to be hidden. No one puts a lamp under a bowl because a lamp is designed to help people see in dark places. Christ's words and actions showed the true nature of the world around him. Christ's followers give light to those around them by doing and saying what Jesus did. Do you see what, that, what I wrote down? I wrote doing and then saying what Jesus did. Talk's cheap, but the proof's in the pudding. If we do as Jesus does, then we can talk the talk. Instead of talking the talk and then trying to do what Jesus says. I said this on the, the Sunday that... Uh, uh, Pastor Nick got to take a snow day. And I, I really mean this. If you call yourself a Christian, but the only thing that comes out of your mouth and your actions are terrible, just don't call yourself a Christian. We got enough, we got enough bad uh, press as it is. Christ followers give light to those around them by doing what and saying what Jesus did. By growing in relationship with Jesus every day, following him step by step, we partner with him spreading the truth, the gospel, the good news. John the Beloved said in the first John 1, 5 through 7, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is what? Light. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. 
If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, then we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us all from sin. God is light. We're to walk in the light. If we're not walking in the light, then we're living a lie. Because things, see, when, when, when Michelle and I, back in 2009 and backwards, I did things that I didn't want her to see. Said things I didn't want her to see, to hear. Acted ignorant in things that I didn't want her to hear about. That's darkness. When I walk in darkness that I'm living a lie, if I say that I'm a Christian, I'm talking to me. Light cannot be anything other than what it is. It can't be anything other. It's bright. It dispels darkness. It enables to people to see what they're doing. God is light. And see, since he is his Holy Spirit to live inside believers, so are we. As his ambassadors on earth, we shine even when we don't know it. If you walk in a dark room, a very dark, all black room, you can't see anything. And there's just a speck of light. That light cannot be hid. It cannot be hid. I want to tell you about a vision that I had. We were in here praying. This has been a year and a half ago. The, the staff and elders come in on every Monday, and we try to get together sometimes. So all of us can't be here, but mostly you can always bet there's probably four to eight of us in here praying. And God showed me a vision, and I know it was him because it was a vision of New Covenant Church. And there was light coming out of New Covenant. But it wasn't yellow light. It was a white, bright light. And we were coming, sticking torches into that light and bringing it back out, and they become light themselves. It wasn't a flame. It was a bright light, like an LED, like daylight light, 6,500 aluminum or more. And we would walk off into the, to, the, to the community to where you could not even see anything because it was so dark except those small bits of light. And then we would, then all of a sudden I was seeing them coming back, getting closer and closer and closer. And what, what, it, what it was is Mike Jones, Pastor Nick, and the others that were with us was there. They had somebody with them. And they had the same looking torch stick. And they walked to the light, to the church, and they stuck it in. And they come back out with a light. And they went off along with the ones that were already here. And it got almost where you couldn't see them. And then all of a sudden they started coming back. And they brought somebody with the same type of torch stick that stuck it in. And the same thing did over and over again until the whole, well, I call valley, was lit up. You could see all the way to past the community college. You could see all the way over to Walmart. You could see all the way over to, to uh, 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 almost Thickety up this way. All the way up up Crabtree Mountain. All from just here. It was bright everywhere. It was light, a bright light. As his ambassadors on earth, we shine even when we don't know it. The second thing God told me out of this scripture is it's time to be free. Time to be free. Now, he who the sun sets free is what? Free indeed. And if the sun that you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? It also says make you free. I don't know about you, but we've had some, I've, my kids would catch anything wild and bring it in the house and Michelle would have fits. I'm talking lizards, it didn't matter. Joshua Rowland kept everything. And sometimes you'd let it loose, you'd set it free and it'd come right back in the house. It says you shall know the truth and the, sh the truth shall make you free. And when he makes you free, you is free indeed. Amen. 
Luke chapter 4, 18 through 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord. Now, I know you're saying, well, Jesus said that. Jesus said that. I know that. But I believe what God said has said to me. And I know that my brothers and sisters here at New Covenant Church would almost feel the same way. That, that I believe God wants us to put ourselves in this passage, telling us, his followers, the Christians, the little anointed ones. You know what that means, don't you? Did you know that? Christ is the anointed one. Christians, which we were first called in Antioch, is little anointed ones. But us little anointed ones, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, And we, you, I, have been anointed to preach the good news and to set the captives free, to heal the sick and proclaim the year of our Lord. Does that sound like you? Do you believe the Spirit of the Lord is upon you? Do you believe that He's called you to go and to set the captives free? Ernie Gentry, do you believe that? Are you going all over the the world doing that? Yes, sir, you are. You believe it. It's instilled in you. See, Jesus sent out the disciples when he, when he sent out the 12, two by two. Now, is there, do I have any chaplains in here that, that, that are in here Monday through Thursday? Missy. Missy, what do I tell you? If I'm going to go somewhere, I tell you to do one thing, and that's heal the sick, raise the dead, make the lame walk, the blind see, and set those that are in captivity free. Because he sent them to do it. He said that as you preach, go saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, and cast out demons. But see, that was the twelve. But then in John chapter 20 verse 21, he says this. Peace be unto you, Ricky. As the Father has sent me, thou I send you. When he breathed on him and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. What he said was, as the Father sent me to do those things, I know I told you to do that before, but now I'm really sending you and I'm giving you the Holy Spirit to equip you to do those things. That scripture I read that it was for our adoptions to be as sons. Sons, S-O-N-S, sons. And ladies, that's non genderous Amen, Walls. Some translations, maybe the NLT and others say, you to be children of God. Sons was never intended to be male. Because in the kingdom of God, there is no Greek or Jew, slave or free man, or male or female. We're sons. We're heirs. Hmm. The last thing is time to be a son. Time to be a son. First I talked to you about time to be a light. That's what we're called to do. We're to reflect. That's what we're supposed to do. We're to reflect him. I talked about it a few years ago about how a refiner is is, um, back when I was in the jewelry business. And and, um, um, some of y'all may have known Jim. Jim will tell you he used to see me all the time. But I was, I was in the, I was a pawnbroker and did lots of jewelry. And watching how this happened was is is Jesus referred to the silversmith, and it was so great that Jesus referred to the silversmith because what happens is is that he says I'm the fire and the refiner. What that means is is he knows how much time to leave the fire on and how hot to get it because with silver if you get it too hot. You ruin it. I said ruin. You ruin it. Not ruin. Ruin something you can fix. Ruin, there is no hope. Amen? You'll ruin it. But the Lord knows exactly how much time to leave it on and how much heat and how long to leave that blue flame on it to refine it till he keeps wiping away all the dross till it's all gone. And can somebody tell me when he knows it's through? Does anybody know? How does he know? He sees his own reflection. 
It's not that we are actually the light. It's that we're reflecting who's in us back to himself. Kind of like the moon does the sun. But until we get all the dross out, get all that out of our life, we can't reflect like we were intended to reflect. That's one of them statements, if you can't talk the talk, best just not talk at all. If you can't walk the walk, don't talk the talk. I remember my little daddy, he was, he was short, and I used to call him out quite a bit because I, I grew, I was pretty good size by eighth grade, and I used to like to provoke my little old daddy. That was not very smart because he had a brother that was six foot one and meaner than a striped snake. And my Uncle Paul will tell you, he's only, he's only a couple times he's really been hurt, and my daddy was one of them. My mama was the other, by the way. I don't know where that came from. I was thinking about my daddy. It's Christmas time. Me and Pastor Mike was talking about him earlier today. I love him. Time to be a son. To redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6 or 7, it says this. That he chose to adopt us because it made him happy. He chose to send his son to die on a cross. To give us hope because us getting adopted made him happy. I'm sorry, i got to jump a little bit. That's great news. That me being adopted by, by my Father through the blood of Christ makes him happy. I don't know about you, but that's something to shout about. That makes me excited that somebody loved me enough to send their only begotten son to give his life for me just so he could adopt me. So he could bridge that gap so I may have relationship with him. Mm. So this Christmas season, a season of giving where God gave His only begotten Son, that whomsoever would believe in Him would not have to perish but have eternal life. That He sent His only begotten Son not to condemn or judge us, but that the world through Him might be saved. And by believing in him, I would not be condemned. But not believing in him, I would be already condemned. But remember this Christmas season. And because, listen, listen to this. This is Galatians 4, 6, and 7. I read you the, the two verses before. But 6 and 7 says, And because you are the sons, God has sent for his spirit of his son into your hearts crying Abba, Father. See, Father is not the best word. It's more like, I called my daddy, Daddy. It's more like Abba, Daddy. He sent forth his spirit in me that I can call him Daddy. And that allows me to go boldly through the, the, the already ripped veil. We sing a song about that I spread the sea so you can walk right through it. That ain't all he did. He ripped the veil so that I can go right before him, before the throne of grace in a time of need with nothing but praise in my hands. You know, I bet Herod or Augustus, when you come to see him, you better have something good. You better have something good to give him, not expecting anything in return either. You give it and hope it was good enough. But our father, our daddy says, bring it before me. And it's every, it's all good. Because there's nothing we could give him except that praise and the obedience. Uttermost obedience and praise. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his, son, his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Daddy, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through Christ Jesus. When I think of this scripture, 
I think about 1 Corinthians, and it's probably my, I've probably preached this, mess, this scripture more than any other message in the past probably six, seven years. Some of you probably even know the Greek word for it because I've said it so many times. But that same spirit that's within you that cries out, Abba, Father, is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and set him at the right hand of the Father, giving him all power, authority, dominion above every name, above addiction, above divorce, above abuse, above poverty, above manipulation. All names before, then, and ever to come under his feet and me being made an heir. Me being made an heir. Verse 2 and 6 says that I'm seated right with him, in him. You know what that means, Seneca? All power and authority is given to you because you're with him and in him. Speak to those things and tell him to go to the feet of Jesus. You have all power and authority over them because it's the spirit in you that allows that. You want a reason to be thankful this Christmas season? You've been made a son. You've been adopted. We used to sing a song called Shake Hands with a Poor Boy Who Owns Everything. I've been adopted. I've joined heirs with a king. Shake hands with a poor boy. Who owns everything. I don't need anything. His grace is sufficient. But I'm going to tell you something. When he said you're an heir. That means you're entitled to everything. Not some things. Everything. Power. authority, And I'm not preaching prosperity. That's not what I'm saying. Because to get everything is just to give it away. That's what your generosity is. I know a man that lives from donation to donation, running a ministry. He was given a sizable donation. And you know he was probably happy because he got it. And Pastor Michael verified this. He gave about 90% of it away. I loved to be in that room when his wife said, you did what? What? This Christmas season, you want a reason to be happy? When life around you is turbulent, remember you're a son. This Christmas season, remember that he was born to die so that I would have life. Sozo life. Life now and to come. Bow your heads, please. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your loving grace and mercy. Thank you that our adoption makes you happy. God, all we can give you is our praise and our obedience. God, we ask you tonight, with every head bowed and every eye shut, I, Chip Plemons, ask you, God, and anybody here with me, it's in agreement to help show me disobedience before I'm disobedient. Show me before I make those mistakes, God. I ask you, God, if you agree with me tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed, and you would like for God to show you any disobedience before it happens, would you raise your hand? God, you see these, you see these hands. Show them to us, God. Before we mess up. And I know you're sovereign and all things work together for my good. But God, we ask you to show us so we can be so obedient to you that we may reflect you like we never have before. God, this Christmas season, let it be different than it ever has been. Let us reflect you to the world like we never have. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't ever like to close a service without giving the opportunity. If you've never really 
accepted Jesus as your Savior. You may have prayed a prayer as a child, but you never really meet it. You never made him Lord of your life. You've never felt the adoption from him. And today you want to make that decision. Today you want to publicly say, I want salvation and I want to be adopted. Would you raise your hand in the air for me, please? Amen. God sees you. God sees you. Is there anybody else? Hallelujah. Is there anybody else? God sees you. With every head bowed, we're going to pray. All of us. But especially the ones that rose, raised their hands. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Today, I accept your adoption of me. Forgive me of all past sins. Apply your blood to my life. And today I publicly proclaim. I say it again. Today I publicly proclaim. You are my Lord. In Jesus mighty name. The strong son of God. Amen. Amen. Those that raise their hands. I urge you. To get into a discipleship program, you need to learn more and more and more about about the Word of God and about what God has in store for you. The devil has been lying to you for many, many years, and now you've decided to accept the adoption, accept his lordship, accept his forgiveness, and it's all clean. You are made new today, December 20th, 2017. You have been adopted. Join heirs with the king. Amen.